and we should be set. Great, thank you. Okay, good evening. I'm calling this public hearing to order in accordance with the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act, MGLC 131, Section 40 in the Boston Wetlands Ordinance, Boston City Code, Ordinances Chapter 7-1.4, the Boston Conservation Commission will hold a virtual public hearing this evening on April 17th, 2024 to, to review the following projects to determine what conditions, if any, the commission will impose in order to protect the interests of the public and private water supply, groundwater prevention of pollution, flood control, prevention of storm damage, protection of fisheries and land containing shellfish, and protection of wildlife habitat. Um, in accordance with Chapter 107 of the Acts of 2022, we are conducting this meeting online to ensure public access to the deliberations of the Conservation Commission. The public may access this call through telephone and video conferencing. Additionally, the meeting is being recorded. If you do not wish to be recorded, please turn off your video. Members of the public may have an opportunity to ask questions and provide public comment on applications and discussions. To do so, please raise your hand or type in the chat in the application via the Zoom meeting platform. If you're calling in and cannot use the platform, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine and star six to unmute yourself. Send your questions to staff uh, via email at cc at boston.gov. Uh, for the record, I am Michael Parker, chair of the commission. Uh, call the role of uh, commissioners who are present, Commissioner Sullivan. John Sullivan. Commissioner Long. Nick Long. Commissioner Wilson. Mike Wilson. Commissioner Conan. Conan Thiruvengadam. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Richmond, has she joined us? I haven't seen her. Okay. Okay. Okay, could staff please identify themselves? Elena Itamari with the Environment Department. Didi Hernandez with the Environment Department. Great, thank you. Okay, um, because of potential quorum issues, I'm going to uh, go directly to a request for um, certificates of compliance. And I don't know if you need to move your screen around, DD, up for that. It's a couple of uh, slides away. Okay. So bear with me. I'll let you catch up. Okay. Too much. All right. Great. Okay. You Thank you. Okay. So the first uh, request is for a certificate of compliance for DEP file number 0061774 for the demolition of a residential building and construction of a new multifamily residential building located at 839 Saratoga Street in East Boston. Resource areas land subject to coastal storm flowage. Elena, what do you have on this one? So on this one, um, we have not received an update from the applicant's team. Uh, we are still waiting for some more information about some debris removal and landscaping that they are meant to be doing. So um, we would recommend that the commission hold off on a vote for now. Okay, thank you. So we'll table that one. Next item is a request for a certificate of compliance for DEP file number 0061463 for the ecological restoration of multiple trailheads in Allendale Woods Urban Wild, 89 Veterans of Foreign Wars Parkway, West Roxbury. Uh, the resource areas are uh, Bank, uh, BVW, and Riverfront Area. Uh, Commissioner Long, I believe you have to recuse yourself for this. Yeah, Chair Parker, after accused, since this is an urban wilds project. Okay, thanks. Um, Elena, what do you have on that? Uh, so we were able to conduct a uh, site visit for this project on uh, the 11th of April. We didn't find anything that was still outstanding, and all of the work seemed to be done according to the permit which was issued. So in light of that, uh, staff would recommend that the commission issue a certificate of compliance. Great, thank you. Uh, do any of the commissioners have any questions on this one? No. Nope. Okay. Thank you. So with that, I would um, entertain a motion to issue a certificate of compliance for DEP file number 0061463. So moved. Thank you. Second. Second. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Sullivan. Aye. Commissioner Long. I'm sorry. Commissioner Wilson. Aye. Commissioner Conan. Aye. Uh, and I vote aye, so that carries for nothing. Okay, thank you. Uh, last request for a certificate of compliance is for DEP. Um, Chair Parker. Yes. Commissioner Richmond is here. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, 
So we have now the last one. It's a request for a certificate of compliance for DEP phone number 0061886 for the reconstruction of a section of a triple-decker building and open dock located at 695 Bennington Street in East Boston. Resource area is land subject to coastal storm flowage. Eleanor, what do you have on this one? Similarly, we conducted a site visit on April 11th. Uh, we found everything to be uh, wrapped up as far as the construction goes and the work seemed to be done in accordance with the permit and based on this we would recommend that the commission issue a certificate of compliance for the work great thank you uh any questions from commissioners in the staff comments um, there is a line that says no there were no major deviations uh, can you expand on that lena were there minor deviations uh apologies from that so See. Looking back at our notes. Didi, sorry, do you happen to remember um what our, our thought was on that? I can't recall right now, but I believe there might be a rep on the call. Thomas Q, I believe, might be here and uh, might be able to expand on that. Or, uh, Tom Q yeah. was the rep for this one. Do we have a certification? Pardon? Do we have a certification from the engineer or consultant here? We do. What does that say? Uh, the pre-existing deck was removed, but not rebuilt. So is it your understanding that was the... Um, only deviation. Yes, and that's what the, that's what the certification is saying. With less of an impact, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think that's your answer. I don't recall any other deviations from what was originally permitted. Okay. Okay. Anything else from commissioners? Okay, so that I would enter, entertain a motion to um, issue a certificate of compliance for DEP file number 0061886. So moved. We have a second. Anyone? Second. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Sullivan? You almost made me second. Um, aye. Commissioner Long? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Commissioner Conan? Aye. Commissioner Richmond? She might not be online yet. Uh, I'll vote aye, so that carries 5 nothing. Okay. Thank you. Now we'll go back to the uh, NOIs that we have on tap tonight. First one is notice of intent for DEP file number 006. 1984 in Boston file number 2024-009 um, from Childs Engineering on behalf of the Venezia Real Estate LLC for the proposed removal and replacement of a section of the existing building and pile supported foundation over the water located at 20 Erickson Street, sorry, Erickson Street in Dorchester. Um, resource areas are land under ocean, coastal bank, uh, coastal beach, 100 foot buffer to coastal bank, land subject to coastal storm flowage, 25 foot waterfront area, 25 foot riverfront area, 100 foot buffer to tidal flats, and it is located within an area of critical environmental concern. Um, so we heard this, this was continued from our last hearing. Uh, what we were waiting on were, uh, comments from DMF for possible inclusion into the order of conditions. Uh, Elena, did we get anything from DMF? Yes, so for, um, we had heard back from them, DMF didn't have any concerns about, um, about the project. 
And I believe the other outstanding item was a question of means and methods of construction, which uh, I'd gotten clarification on uh, from Commissioner Herbst. And it sounded as though her recommendation was to include a special condition, which would uh, just dictate that the applicant provide uh, the means and methods of construction for the work uh, prior to the commencement of work. So not necessarily uh, before the commission closes the hearing. Okay. Okay. Uh, who's here on behalf of the applicant? This is Charlie Roberts from Child Engineering. Hi, Charlie. Uh, do you have anything to add to uh, what we just discussed? Nope, no, that, that, that was it. Okay, you'll be able to provide us the uh, means and methods uh, report that we're looking for a document? Yeah, yeah. Okay, sounds good. Uh, Elena, anybody from the public uh, raise their hand? I'm not seeing any raised hands and we had also not received any uh, any emails about this. Okay. Any questions from any of the commissioners? Okay. Hearing none, I would entertain a motion to um, close this hearing, uh, issue the order of conditions with the special condition that the applicant will provide uh, the construction means and methods prior to construction to staff. I moved. We have a second. Second. Thank you. Commissioner Sullivan. Aye. Commissioner Long? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Commissioner Conan? Aye. Commissioner Richmond? She joined us. I don't see her, so. Okay. And I vote aye. Uh, that carries five nothing. Uh, Chair Parker, I, I believe Commissioner Richmond may have had trouble unmuting. It's not seeming to let me ask her to unmute either. Okay. If she can hear us, hopefully she'll. Should get that rectified. Okay. Uh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Or she could um, participate via chat if she's having an issue. But anyway, um, next item on the agenda is notice of intent for DDP file number 0061985 and Boston file number 2024-010 from Crowley Cottrell on behalf of the Department of Conservation and Recreation for the proposed replanting within existing planting beds in Paul Revere Park located at Warren Avenue in Charlestown. Uh, resource areas, 25 foot riverfront area, 25 foot waterfront area, land subject to coastal storm flowage, 100 foot buffer to coastal beach and 100 foot buffer to bank. Who's here on behalf of the applicant? Um, hi, uh, there's two of us here. Um, I'm Michelle, thank you for having us. I'm Michelle Crowley, principal of Crowley Cottrell, and I'm also here with Brooke Warfel, who is um, an associate at Crowley Cottrell. Um, we have a presentation to go through. Um, can we go to the next slide? Um, this is Paul Revere Park. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just to quickly orient, um, Paul Revere Park is on the north side of uh, the Charles River Locks, um, adjacent to uh, the North Point Park. Um, next slide. So our project, um, we're here uh, seeking um, approval for a replanting project within the existing beds that surround uh, the oval lawn. And we're only working within these beds that are highlighted in blue here. A um, little bit of the history, uh, this site uh, was designed um, a little under 30 years ago by Ohm Van Sweden, who's very well known for doing large, colorful drifts of perennials and shrubs. So really creating a garden space. So this is more of a garden um, as part of than um, a public park. Um, it's a public garden. Um, after the, all this time, um, the, the beautiful sweeps of plants have diminished and now non-natives have thrived in sort of sporadic locations, while there a lot of the planting beds are just bare mulch. So what we've been working with uh, DCR to create a plant palette that will thrive in the harsh conditions of this heavily used uh, park and make it a garden again on the waterfront. Um, we want to use the same idea of the, the drift concept that Ohm Van Sweden did, so we can have a nod to them, they're fantastic landscape architects, um, as that they had intended um, for, this, for this park. 
Um, and if we go to the next slide, I have just two slides to just show some of the existing conditions where you can see um, the, a lot of the areas are just bare mulch with a, a couple uh, a couple shrubs um, and no canopy no canopy trees. Um, mulch has creeped into the sidewalk so that it's gone out of the beds as you can see down on the lower on the lower right. Um, the next slide uh, is just more just showing the now there's just um, daylilies and miscanthus drifts are all that's really left. Um, and uh, again, just more bare mulch everywhere instead of the planting drifts. Um, the, I'm gonna move to, uh, Brooke is gonna then present the actual design of uh, these plans. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Brooke. So this is the existing plan. It shows the relationship of the planting beds to the resource areas. Um, the entire site is classified as land subject to coastal storm flowage, and the rest of the resources are primarily, as you can see with those colored lines, in the south portion of the site. Uh, the gray hatched area, which is a little hard to tell in this plan now, is where all of the beds have no planting and only open mulch. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, this is our demo and prep plan. All the trees to remain will be protected within both the planting beds and the lawn area. Uh, in the north beds, we're removing four Coosa dogwoods that are in poor health and one canopy tree that's already dead. Our proposed plan will replant five understory trees and seven canopy trees. The entire site will be fenced, catch basins are going to be lined with silt sacks, and erosion controlled follow the entire limit of work. Um, can you go to the next one? This is our materials. So before replanting starts, we're going to remove years of mulch and amend the soil to support the new planting. And the number one concern for our new planting is dog activity in the park. So establishment fencing is proposed for all sections of the planting beds that aren't significantly elevated. And then the next one is where it gets exciting with the planting plan. <laughs> and the next three slides, you can see how we drew inspiration from the original garden design to create drifts of color and texture. Canopy trees are distributed throughout the beds to add shade, understory trees and shrubs add structure, and perennials and grasses will fill in the ground plane. Our design intention is not only to restore the planting beds, to, but to increase habitat, be an asset to pollinators, and to stabilize soil in the resource areas. So if you just want to flip through the next two slides, you can see blow-ups of the north beds, and the next is south beds. And that's all. Great. Thank you, Brooke. Um, I don't really have anything on this other than, uh, does anybody know anything about the uh, music? They're not really chimes. You hit them as you walk over the bridge to the park. Um, I know that I hit them every single time I go over there. Yeah, and like every third one works maybe. Oh, really? Yeah, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. Um, but when they all work, they're beautiful. Um, yes. Okay. Sounds like no one except for you knows anything about it and you don't have <laughs> authority so hopefully someday okay um elena what I'll do you keep have it on the list okay thank you i appreciate that yeah so we were able to conduct a site visit for this location as well it was great to see kind of where all of these plantings will be going um again just to reiterate the most of the plantings will be in existing beds um and the only note that we had was just confirming uh the number of trees that might be removed during construction and and their species um or at least to sort of maintain open lines of communication with commission staff as that happens. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Sullivan. Yeah, how often do you have to water these plantings before they become established? There is existing irrigation in the beds and we're going to refurbish that and use that to establish them. I don't know exactly how long, probably two years, I would think for establishment. And so you're going to reestablish it. Does that mean you're putting a new one in? 
we need to clarify that with DCR a little bit more. They need to do some more investigation on how that existing irrigation is connected right now. And what kind of can I understand what a planting takes when you want to do that? What's it take to put a new irrigation system in? And do you do more excavation than what was described? There shouldn't plant? be there shouldn't be any more excavation now. No. All right. That's all I had. Great. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Long. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Uh, really great to see such a diverse plant palette for the ground cover plantings. I was kind of interested in uh, what you mentioned about the dog activity in the beds being an issue. Is there anybody on the call from the project team who can fill us in a little more on the dog issues in the planting beds? It sounds like the temporary fencing will help. Yeah, right now, I mean, just by being on site and seeing it, it's just that there isn't uh, leashes are not used frequently in this park because it does have the walls on the edges. It sort of feels contained. And so people let their dogs off leashes and they just go straight into the planting beds. Hopefully having the fence where the planting beds aren't raised will help that. Commissioner Long, um, I can attest to the fact that it has become Charlestown's dog park. Yeah, I try not to call it that. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, yeah. I know DCR does not. And not um, maybe the thought is that the, the ground cover plantings and everything else will get tall enough once they're established. And then at that point, is that when the fencing might come down? Yes. And then that maybe the, the height of plants will be enough to discourage yeah. the dogs. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, that's really all I had. Um, looks like a great project, great park. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Wilson. Yeah, no further comments here. Appreciate it. Thank you. Commissioner Connor. Thank you. Yeah, excited for this project. Um, in addition to the fence idea, um, have signs been considered? Uh, we plan know. on putting signs on the fence during establishment to talk about it. Uh, it's something that we could talk about with DCR to see what they would think about putting signs there too. Yeah, sometimes something is I want to say that helps. you need there is a sign about needing a leash, but no, I'm not 100% sure. Well, leash is one thing, and also yeah. just asking people to respect the the planted areas another. Yes, I agree. So, yeah. Okay. Um, I had nothing else. Thank you. Looking okay. forward to the project. Thank you. Commissioner Wilson? Uh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Richmond. Are you I, able to unmute? No, I'm finally unmuted. I apologize to everybody. Um, I have no questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Elena, anything from the public? I am not seeing any hands raised, and we also didn't receive anything in our inbox. Okay, thank you. And uh, I believe that the order conditions is um, all set and acceptable. Should be ready to go, yes. Fantastic. Okay. So that I would entertain a motion to close the hearing and issue the order conditions. So moved. Second. Thank you. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Long? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Commissioner Conan? Aye. Excuse me. Uh, and Com Commissioner Richmond? Aye. And I vote aye. So that carries six nothing. Okay. Thank you. Okay, looking forward to the improvements. Right, thank you very much. Thank you, Commission. Okay, next item on the agenda is notice of intent for DP file number 0061986 and Boston file number 2024-001 from SWCA Environmental Consultants on behalf of the Department of Conservation and Recreation for an Ecological Restoration Limited Project for the Management of Invasive Plant Species located at 1375 Bennington Street, East Boston, uh, we have for resource areas, uh, bordering vegetated wetlands, 100 foot buffer to bordering vegetated wetlands, salt marsh, 100 foot buffer to salt marsh, land subject to coastal storm flowage and 25 foot um, waterfront area. And it's located within uh, an area of um, critical environmental concern. Who's here on behalf of the applicant? Uh, hello. Oh, go ahead, Megan. I'll let you start. Okay. Yes. Uh, hello, Commission. I am. Um, 
My name is Megan Shave. I am a senior ecologist with the Department of Conservation and Recreation. And I'm here tonight with Naomi Valentine and Meredith Borenstein from SWCA to present this notice of intent. And I believe we have a presentation that we can quickly. Thank you. So just as an introduction, um, this project is being proposed out of the Office of Natural Resources at DCR, where we do management of invasive species within priority parks and of priority early detection species within DCR. And Belle Isle Marsh Reservation has been identified as a high priority site due to its location within an ACEC, as long as as well as its sensitive resources, including wetlands, rare species habitat, and biomap um, components. So we are proposing today an ecological restoration limited project for invasive plant management for the purpose of resource area enhancement. Um, next slide, please. So Belle Isle Marsh Reservation is located in East Boston. In total, the reservation itself is over 300 acres owned primarily by DCR. This project that we are proposing under the current NOI is focusing on what is known as the main park of Belle Isle Reservation. It is about a 30 acre parcel off of Bennington Street in East Boston. And this area is defined by the existing landscaping and path around the main park, as well as a central grassland area and associated shrub thickets and wetland borders to the salt marsh throughout the rest of the reservation. The next slide, please. So the purpose of proposing invasive species management within the main park is broadly speaking to improve resource area function and rare wildlife habitat by decreasing invasive plants throughout the park in order to encourage resilient native vegetation over time. The goal for focusing on the main park at this time is to target some of our high priority early detection species before they encroach further into the park. For example, in the center of the main park is our grassland area that is an important bird area. And there are some early populations of invasive black swallowwort, for example, in that important grassland that we would like to begin treating uh, as early as possible to prevent spread and possible need for more intensive measures in the future. And so with that, I will pass it along to SWCA to review some more details of the NOI itself. Great, thank you. Could I just ask you before you go, um, what department are you in within DCR? I didn't uh, write that down. It is the Office of Natural Resources. Oh, great. Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Meredith Bornstein, I'm wetland scientist for SWCA. Um, I helped file this notice of intent um, with the city. And so thank you so much, Megan, for giving that overview. Um, if we could just go to the next slide. Um, I just wanted to mention the resource areas that we're looking at here where we are proposing um, invasive species plant management. And just so you know, when we say work, all that means is um, treatment of invasives. There is, there'll be no ground disturbance um, as part of this project. So there is a small amount of salt marsh. Uh, most of the site is mapped as um, land subject to coastal storm flowage. There are some inland bordering vegetated wetland, and of course the buffer zone to um, BBW, as well as the buffer zone to the salt marsh area and the city's um, 25 foot waterfront area. And let's see. So if you can go to the next slide and this is our um, proposed work plan. It's a little hard to see, but um, I wish I could zoom in more, but so the yellow area is um, mapped salt marsh on the site. The green polygons are bordering vegetated wetland. Um, also, please note that the 
what is shown here is um, there are other resources outside of our project area, but we are only showing where we're proposing work. And those little red polygons are just areas where we have mapped um, existing invasive populations that we'll be hoping to treat this year. So um, as you can see, it's pretty it's a pretty small project. Um, luckily right now we've caught these populations early enough that they're not spread throughout, but that's why we're here trying to get a jump start on the treatment of these things. So um, and there even there is some polygons outside of jurisdiction, but we showed everything just so the commission knows exactly what, where we're proposing any work. Um, let's see, I think I can go to the next slide. And actually, yeah, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague Naomi Valentine to talk about exactly what's proposed. Um, I have a couple different options for plant management. And she's there on that. Okay. Um, just to introduce myself again, Naomi Valentine from SWCA. I work in our ecological restoration division and we have quite a bit of experience in invasive plant management and planning. So the majority of the species that are on site um, would require some level of herbicide application to effectively manage, but if there are any individual species that are small enough that it'd be appropriately to effectively manage them with hand pulling, that's also an option. So manual and chemical management are the two proposed methods with the species on site being European buckthorn, shrub honeysuckle, invasive shrub honeysuckle, uh, Asiatic bittersweet, autumn olive, garlic mustard, phragmites, black swallowwort, and porcelain berry. If you can go to the next slide, we put the um, table that's in the notice of intent that breaks down the potential management methods for each of them. And I don't need to read all of this out to you all. Um, you have the notice of intent, but just to comment that um, there are a couple different options for each invasive plant. Uh, the common reed and the black swallowwort um, would likely be managed with a glyphosate herbicide product, but there are alternatives if necessary. And um, basically any of the herbaceous uh, plants except for um, garlic mustard would most likely be, well, garlic mustard could be treated with glyphosate if needed for the first year growth, but second year growth can be easily hand pulled as well. And these populations are small enough now that it should be fairly manageable to do that with um, the smaller plant species. Um, black swallowwort that Megan pointed out in the beginning is a high target for this site. Hopefully it can be managed this year. Um, and that would also likely be accomplished with a targeted glyphosate application. All the herbicide applications would be conducted from a low volume backpack sprayer. And um, there's good enough access up to each of the populations that it can be a very targeted um, treatment. If there's any non-target native vegetation nearby, they can always be shielded if necessary. Um, most of these are pretty well accessible at this point in time, now that they've been detected so early before exploding within the park. Um, and with that, I think the only last thing we wanted to mention was just that this has been approved by Heritage. We had communication back and forth ahead of time this morning about that. But Meredith, did you have any other comment you wanted to say about the natural heritage conditions? I know they made it into the draft orders. Yeah, I just wanted to mention to the commission that we did receive a no-take letter um, from natural heritage and their conditions were um, to request that within the order of conditions, these three, I, summar I summarized the conditions here, um, but they requested that these conditions get put into the order. And I sent that letter to Elena. Um, she also got it from Natural Heritage, but I just wanted to mention these three orders. And one of them is, um, I don't know if you folks can do this, but issue an order for five years. Um, so it's congruent with Natural Heritage. Um, also, they they requested a time of year a restriction, which makes sense given the species that are out there. And of course, um, no work shall alter soil, which we're not proposing to do anyways. So um, with that, we're all happy to take any. Sure. Commission. Okay. So Meredith, we can't issue the uh, order conditions for duration longer than three years, but uh, if there is an extension that's requested, um, you have authorization for five years. So that would be reflected for the uh, National um, Heritage. Um, that would be reflected in the extension 
Oh, perfect. So, yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, it seems okay. to me that would work. Um, yeah. I don't really have any questions, but um, Megan, while um, we're lucky enough to have you here, um, just if you had a minute or two, just to um, uh, give a summary of the health of the salt marsh itself. I thought I had read somewhere that maybe the area was decreasing. Um, I, I can't, don't quote me on that. Um, and also, you know, whether that's true or not, and um, just the general overall health of the salt marsh, if you don't mind. Yes. So this project is obviously a very small piece of the broader picture at Belle Isle Marsh. And so what you might have heard of might be reference to um, an environmental inventory that was completed by the Woods Hole Group in 2022. Uh, that was funded by a grant that was pursued by various partner organizations, including the Mystic River Watershed Association. And so that environmental inventory did include um, a variety of analyses related to hydraulics and what's considering in the face of climate change, what might be happening to the entire reservation in the future. And yes, there are general comments related to um, changes in water level and what that could mean for the entire reservation, as well as some recommendations that DCR will be pursuing or exploring for greater restoration projects. So for example, this project here is focusing on the main park, but to the south of the main park is the large sort of transitional marsh that goes into the salt marsh that's known as the L berm, based on the sort of rectangular berm that goes around it. And so for example, um, DCR will be exploring potential work that can be done on the berm restoration, um, as well as in some of the other man-made locations throughout the marsh. For example, the mosquito ditches um, could require or could benefit from remediation. So there's certainly a whole um, palette of um, threats and recommendations that are outlined in that environmental inventory. And again, that's from 2022, so quite recent. Um, so I would say at that point, you know, working with the Mystic River Watershed Association and the Friends of Belle Isle, um, there's certainly concerns about the reservation, but there are options that DCR will be exploring for some of these remediation efforts. And this invasive species NOI, again, is sort of our first step in being proactive um, with some of these concerns, in this case, with um, some of our um, early detection invasive species. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, Eleanor, what do you have on this? We didn't have much else uh, to add. We were going to just flag those special conditions at the end of the uh, draft order. But other than that, um, everything was basically uh, covered by the presentation. So thank you both. Great. Thank you. And so you've captured those and they're contained in the um, conditions in our file. right? We now. have. Yes. So we included them at the bottom under uh, additional conditions and they're identified as being requests by national or natural heritage. Great. Thank you. OK, Commissioner Sullivan. Uh, I didn't hear it mentioned, but all this work will be done by a uh, licensed outside contractor or TCS staff. Yes. So this, this broad, this is basically our high priority invasive species management throughout Eastern Massachusetts. It is done through a contract currently held by SWCA and their licensed contractors. And again, going forward, any contract awarded for future management would be required to have uh, licensed herbicide applicators. And how do you, after you've destroyed the uh, invasives, how do you encourage non-invasives to take their place? So you'd be surprised how well things will naturally regenerate, but there's always an option to put down a seed mix to sort of overpower any other um, any other vegetation that would want to grow up. Luckily, uh, most of the species on site are sort of contained within the site. And so the hope is that um, getting them now before they 
turn into larger populations will do that for us. Um, but there is also a possibility that, you know, monitoring the site year after year, if in that first year after management, there's not any growth coming up, you could throw down a seed mix as sort of a um, effective and cost-effective means of encouraging native regeneration. And how many years does it make you feel that you are achieving something or you just, this is just for a forever job? Well, the there's guys. always a chance that some birds or something or people or dogs could bring more invasives into the site. But luckily, DCR has identified these populations pretty early. <clears throat> and so it's possible that some of the plants could be managed within a season, possible a couple seasons. Um, the Phragmites is a larger effort with the broader um, project that Megan was talking about, but most of the species on site should be pretty well managed within the the time frame of this initial permit if it's issued. All right, that's all I had. Great, thank you, uh, Commissioner Long. Yeah, thank you for the presentation, everyone. Uh, very excited to see this project. This place is near and dear to my heart. Um, I guess that most of my questions are around the. Um, some of the specifics with the invasive management and um, sort of the goals of the, the effort of the early detection and treatment here. So um, I guess first question, you kind of already answered Naomi, but what is what is the overall sense you all have of the, the invasives that are in the seed bank that might you know come back up? Um, that's an interesting question. I'm, some of the invasives that are located on site do have a pretty strong ability to drop seed. I see that Megan just unmuted and she did the invasive survey, so she might have a better answer for you. Yes, so I would say, and again, this is just based on my field observations, um, particularly, for example, the black swallowwort, I would think probably has, it's been there at least a year. I would think it hasn't been there too long, just based on the sizes of the patches. In some cases, um, the patch is only a couple of plants. It's only a few feet wide, which suggests that the patch cannot be very old given how quickly um, the seeds can spread. So there's anticipated with the swallowwort, um, certainly the seeds that dispersed within the past year potentially could have enlarged the footprint, but we're hoping that it is, we're working within what we've proposed. And in terms of things like the Asiatic bittersweet, again, there are some patches, but they are still quite isolated to suggest that, again, they are either fairly new or are isolated um, because of the grassland characteristic. The bittersweet in particular is mostly isolated to the shrub thicket portions of the park. So again, they might have been there for several years, but fortunately um, bittersweet is not wind dispersed like swallowwort is. So while it's possible, birds have been spreading it for a few years. Again, so far it seems to be isolated to the shrub thickets and fairly manageable. So again, we're expecting um, the footprints that they're found currently will be the footprints that we will see them in, in the upcoming spring. And then same with, I would say, um, the shrubs are kind of mostly overlap with the bittersweet, the shrub um, honeysuckles and the buckthorn are kind of all in the same shrub thicket. So they're kind of, again, off occupying that little patch of habitat um, at the corner that's sort of between the landscaped park and the salt marsh. So we're, again, hoping there's not too much spread because it's pretty isolated. And then similarly, finally, the garlic mustard is pretty much limited to that little small buffer zone area between landscaping and the salt marsh or the BBW. So again, it might have been there for several years, but it seems to be operating within um, its existing footprint. And the idea being that we can hopefully help control it within the footprint it's already in before it spreads. But I would anticipate, given the habitat out there, it each species is sort of appearing where we would expect it, with the exception, again, of the swallowwort. I think 
there's a very small patch in the grassland, that one does have the potential to explode if we don't start treating it because the swallowwort does grow quickly, wind disperse seeds. If we don't get to it, it could take over that central grassland much more than that initial patch has indicated. Yeah, thank you, Megan. That all that all makes perfect sense. Uh, sort of to that end, for uh, species like maybe buckthorn, if we're doing treatment late in the summer, or I guess any other species, um, if they have fruit or seeds on them, um, would you all plan to dispose of those like fruits and seeds rather than let them fall back into the seed bank or the soil? Yes, so it's part of the standard protocol um, for all of the sites that we manage through this contract. Generally speaking, herbaceous material is taken off site, fruiting bodies, fruit seeds are taken off site. Um, generally speaking, um, very rarely is anything left and it would only be um, you know, non-fruiting woody material, which in this case would probably be limited to um, bittersweet and some of the shrubs, but generally speaking, most of the material gets um, taken off site, mm -hmm. especially if there's any chance of proliferation from that material. That makes sense. Are there any other species that you're like maybe anticipating might show up and show up in your early detection rounds that you haven't seen yet or anything else that's on your radar that you might seek to control if it shows up like in a year or two? Um, in terms of our high detection species, so swallowwort of what's found there now, swallowwort is one of our early detection species. Of course, if we see anything such as mile a minute, which fortunately I did not find any of during the review, but obviously something like that is also a high priority early detection species that if noted, we would be following up because we would not want to um, leave that. Um, but yeah, it would be mostly those sort of things, swallowwort, mile a minute, those fast growing herbaceous vines are a lot of our high, high priority early detection just because of how unwieldy they get if we don't catch them early. One plant I recently learned about is um, a type of pepperweed that's mm -hmm. become a problem in the high marsh um, of the Great Marsh on the North Shore. I was wondering if you've seen any of that on the site. I have not, but again, um, this review or this survey was limited mostly to the main park. Mm -hmm. I did do some reconnaissance of the transitional marsh, um, for again, future planning for a bigger um, marsh restoration project in that Elberm I mentioned that might be coming down the line as a broader project. I have not spent too much time in the higher low salt marsh itself, um, but from what I've heard in talking with um, the park supervisor, um, he did not mention any additional um, species he was aware of in the marsh itself beyond the Phragmites that's in the transitional marsh. Gotcha. That's good to hear. Uh, I wonder if there's a way to, um, or if there's an established process, Chair Parker or um, Elena, or um, if, if the, some of the new species are detected early on, if there can be maybe an admin approval or something like that to include with this NOI, if we get to that point. Yeah, that's a great thought. We might want to put that in the order of conditions. Hopefully it makes Megan's life a little easier. So. Yep, exactly. Great point. Thank you. Uh, I think that was all I had. Um, yeah, sounds like a really great, you know, first phase of, um, you know, much more work to come. Thank you. Commissioner Wilson. Yeah, appreciate all the effort you guys have put into this, and especially with the early identification. Usually we get to this much later in the process, and it's a much bigger deal. So, um, yeah, if you're catching bittersweet in the early phase or these types of things, that's excellent. Um, I guess the one question I had um, is that we've had a number of uh, projects in Belle Isle 
that have tried to minimize the disturbance for the purpose of, you know, not spreading in bases and or attracting them. And I was just curious whether um, you've seen whether those sort of low um, impact access necessary utility things, that type of thing, like, you know, I mean, we permitted some helical piles for boardwalks and stuff like that, whether that's had any effect or whether that's sort of measurable um, given random chance, the amount of time that may have passed since those uh, projects have passed. Yeah, so it's hard to say for sure, um, mostly because prior to this fall, I'm not aware of a park-wide or reservation-wide invasive survey that had been um, conducted beyond, um, it was broadly touched on again in that 2022 environmental inventory by the Woods Hole Group they did list off some of the invasive species that they encountered, but they weren't mapped in the sense of how they've been presented for this NOI, which was the mapping I did this past fall. Um, but just by looking at the distribution, it doesn't seem to me that the invasives out there seem to be attributed to for example, any one boardwalk. I know there's sort of the two boardwalks and then there's that access to the freshwater pond. That's not a formal boardwalk, but it's basically um, an existing path through the Phragmites. Um, so in terms of the distribution, it's pretty scattered throughout the entire reservation. And I think that's just going to be an artifact of that the main park is the most recreationally used part. It has it's directly off the parking lot. It has some manicured lawns, it has paths. So it's always going to have the influence of cars, people, dogs. Um, so I think I didn't see evidence of a particular footprint where you know the density was higher than expected. It seems like there's always, like Naomi mentioned, there's always going to be some influence of human activity in a high recreational area. Um, so again, it's targeting those um, species while they are still manageable. There's no guarantee that something might come in on someone's shoe, you know, another year down the line, but it's best to manage them now when they're scattered like this. Again, you know, we don't want that swallow wart taking over the grassland. No, fair enough, appreciate that. And sort of, I guess my sense is, is that the sort of precautionary principle we've brought to it is, you know, probably beneficial or at least having no effect. Um, I know there was concerns over what we would disturb if we had a larger impact area in terms of the seed bank and, you know, greater levels of access. And it sounds like at least if there's no discernible pat pattern, then that, that that is a good place to be at. And I'm glad it's being well managed. I saw Chair Parker, sorry, you came off. Yeah. I'm sorry, Commissioner Wilson. Oh, I, I, I thought you came off mute, sorry. Oh yeah, no, I I usually stay off because I'll forget to turn back and no. stay. Yeah, so all good. Thank, okay, yeah, thank I'm not you. Not trying to cut you off. Okay. No, all good. Okay, great, thank you, um, Commissioner Connor. It just occurred to me um, that Megan said that uh, she worked with friends of Belle Isle Marsh. You you're a member of Belle Isle Marsh, right? You didn't, but I assume you didn't work I on am. this. Yeah, yeah. I I am, and I didn't work on this. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Can I ask a couple of questions anyway? It, it's your turn. All right. Um, so thank you. It's really exciting. And what a beautiful natural asset we have um, in, in three municipalities. So, so the mention of targeting species while they're still manageable made me wonder in the list of species to manage, are humans included? Just kidding. The, there was um, glyphosate mentioned. Are there is there any concern that about how much of it is being used and how exactly and 
what side effects will remain? Um, I can speak to that broadly. Uh, so glyphosate does have one of the highest affinities for vegetation and soil among other herbicides approved for use in sensitive resource areas in the state. So it doesn't mobilize in soil. It does not, um, well, that's the main thing because it doesn't mobilize in soil. That means that water is not going to drag it anywhere, which is good for a, a situation like this where you have marshland surrounding and a little bit within the project area. Uh, there are other herbicides that were listed in that table just in, in case we needed to use them, but glyphosate is the the one on the list that has the highest affinity for vegetation and soil does get brought into the vegetation and or um, becomes inactive very quickly in soil above basically any other herbicide approved for use in sensitive resource areas. So I don't know if that directly answers your question, but that's that's my answer. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you you are addressing the concern about you know if there is unintended effects that will remain from the use of herbicides in general, but uh, glyphosate in particular. Thank you. The other question I had was around you. You mentioned site supervisor, and currently there isn't one. Is there any dependence on somebody keeping an eye on this as this happens and afterwards? And I don't know when there will be one. Um, there's a freeze for hiring, I think. Yes. So in terms of the, yeah, the park supervisor situation. So Sean Riley, the former park supervisor has um, moved into our office, the office of natural resources as our um, coastal restoration biologist. So we'll still be working with him. He'll still be involved in this project, providing his you know, knowledge of Belle Isle just within a different capacity. Um, in terms of site security, the park itself is going to continue to be operated as it is currently. Um, the parking lot, the main access via the driveway on Bennington Street has a gate that is um, closed and managed by park staff that would be um, its current schedule would be based on um, operation staff at the um, district level um, until the park supervisor position can be rectified. And in terms of access issues to the management itself, it is still a park and will be operating as such, but that is why as part of the proposed conditions and our proposed operating procedure, um, SWCA and our consultants employ signage um, to notify people of areas um, if there is herbicide application um, to help make sure people are aware. And again, most of the management areas are at the boundary of sort of the man the manu manicured areas and either the wetlands or the shrub thickets. So generally they're sort of at the edge of where we would expect people to be going, but there will be signage um, to alert them if, that there are actively managed patches. Thank you. That's all my questions, Chair Parker, and I'm also gonna drop off after this. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks for making the effort to help us reach for him. Of course. Commissioner Richmond? Uh, yeah, I don't have any questions. And I, again, join with others who have complimented the presentation and the thoughtfulness of it all. And I also am looking really forward to this. Great. Thank you. Um, Elena, any hands raised? No hands raised and nothing in the inbox either. Okay. Um, Megan, I uh, made a few um, edits to the uh, order conditions here regarding the natural heritage um, conditions. On the last condition, I just made it clear, it's now condition number 80, that uh, it's a natural, natural heritage authorization, uh, which is contained in conditions 78 and 79, and that is what is uh, authorized for five years. Um, and I did add, um, with the help of um, Commissioner Long, 
uh, condition 73 that applicants shall submit to staff any additional invasive, non-invasive species of concern that are detected that uh, need to be treated as part of this authorized work. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Commissioner Long, does that make sense? That sounds good, Chair. Okay, thank you. Okay, so with that, I would entertain a motion to close the hearing and issue this order of conditions. So moved. We have a second. Second. Thank you. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Long? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Commissioner Richmond? Aye. And I vote aye. That carries five nothing. Okay, thank you and good luck. Thank you, Commission. Thank you. Okay, next item on the agenda is notice of intent for um, unassigned uh, DEP and Boston file numbers from Four Point Associates on behalf of Ocean Havens LLC for the proposed removal of a floating dock from the marina and relocation of two associated pilings within the marina located at 87 Commercial Wharf in the north end. Uh, resource areas are land under ocean and fish runs. Who's here on behalf of the applicant? Owen oh, Chair Parker. Sorry, yes. just for the record, uh, a file number has been issued for this project. So it is DEP file number 0061989 and Boston file number 2024-014. Thank you. Hi, Chair Parker. Um, it's Erica Frazier here from Four Point Associates representing the applicant tonight, Ocean Havens. And with me tonight is uh, Ryan Cantwell with Ocean Havens. Great. Hi, everyone. Hello. Uh, so we can get right into it. Um, next slide, please. And next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so the project is within the marina of Boston Yacht Haven, which is located at the end of Commercial Wharf in the North End Waterfront District. Um, we are proposing to remove an approximately 660 square foot um, floating dock and its two associated 18 inch steel pipe piles. And then within the mer inner marina to the west, there are two deteriorating steel pipe piles that are at risk of failing. And we're proposing to remove those and then reuse the um, piles that were from the floating dock and uh, redrive those piles at that location. Next slide, please. Um, so just for existing conditions, the left photo here shows the floating dock in a deteriorating state. Um, and then the middle photo shows the two piles that are associated with this dock. Um, and then the photo on the left just is an image to show um, the area where the piles are failing in that inner marina. Next slide, please. So the existing wetland resource areas on this site include land under ocean and fish run as their uh, seaward of the mean low water line uh, and located in uh, the Boston Inner Harbor. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the proposed work plan is shown here. Um, the, the two piles securing the floating dock and the two deteriorating piles will be extracted using a vibratory hammer, which will be operated from a barge mounted crane. Um, the two piles that were securing the floating dock will be reinstalled using the same vibratory hammer at the same location of the two deteriorating piles to a depth of approximately 40 feet below the mud line. Um, and then the, the, the um, total impacts will be approximately seven square feet to land under ocean and fish run. Next slide, please. Um, this just really gives a better graphic showing the location of um, the two piles to be, or the four piles to be removed, and then the reinstallation of the two steel pipe piles in that um, inner marina. Next slide, please. So for mitigation measures, we're going to be using a vibratory hammer, um, which reduces noise and um, impacts and reduces um, the turbidity that would be associated with other types of pile driving. And then 
We'll also be using a silk curtain around the area of pile installation um, to minimize any uh, turbidity impacts to the resource areas. Um, next slide, please. So um, in addition to um, the, the work that we're proposing, um, we're, we're hoping that the work can be completed within a week, maybe less, uh, if the weather is permitting. Um, and we're going to be starting as soon as possible um, to allow the marina to open up for the 2024 boating season. And also just more importantly, the failing piles are a safety concern that we wanna address in the immediate term. Um, so if there are any questions um, on the work, uh, we'll definitely take those now. <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you. Um, did the slides get ahead of you there? Yeah, a little bit. Okay, you did a good job. Uh, okay, I um, only have one question as far as the uh, barge itself. Um, I know the work isn't going to take a long time, but um, as far as um, if there's an imminent, uh, yeah, did I say that correctly? Tongue tied tonight, but imminent um, uh, major storm coming in um uh making sure that the barge is uh secured or removed so we don't have something uh slip and sliding away from us there and also the containment of hydraulics uh and other other materials on the barge itself could you just quickly talk about uh plans for that um sure so i believe any time that there, there would be a storm forecasted um ack who is going to be the um, operator of the work will prepare um, the barge for any um, impacts of a storm. Um, and I know that they are also preparing plans um, for the conditions to show where they will um, make sure that any there be any um, oil management plans, um, prevent spill prevention, et cetera. Um, I know that they are preparing those. Great. So we'll need those in our files, but I think that's uh, um, standard protocol. Okay, thank you. And you're very lucky this evening. You're actually uh, catching Commissioner Sullivan on camera for maybe the first time in a half a decade or so. But he's all overlooking the ocean, and he's thinking about all these wonderful natural resources. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, Elena, um, anything on this? Uh, nothing to add to this. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Sullivan. I have no questions. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Long. No questions. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Wilson. Even after looking at the ocean, Commissioner Sullivan, you have no questions. <laughs> well, Anyways. yeah, when is when is when are we gonna finish? But other than that, I have no questions. <laughs> uh you I walk figured what, why the the moon was moving away from us by one inch a year. And I is that that was like a mind blowed my first grader looking at the ocean the other day so but i have no questions relevant to this project thank you guys <laughs> thank you thank you walked right into that i can't believe you asked him that question um commissioner richmond uh, i don't have any questions either <laughs> thank you elena do we have any questions from the public see i'm not seeing any hand just raised and i'm also not seeing anything in our inbox Okay, great. Thank you. And we're all set with the order of conditions. Um, so with that, I would uh, entertain a motion to close the hearing and issue the order. Yeah, issue the order of conditions and close the hearing. So moved. If we wait long enough, Commissioner Sullivan might have to second the motion. Second. <laughs> Remember, uh, it's, not, it's not January. Uh, I say second. I. <laughs> second. Commissioner Long? Aye. Mr. Wilson? Aye. Commissioner Richmond? <laughs> aye. Okay, and I vote aye, so that carries five nothing. Okay, thank you, Erica. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Um, okay, next item on the agenda is a request for a determination of applicability from uh, AECCOM on behalf of the Department of Conservation and Recreation for the proposed installation of a Line extension located in the segment of William J. Boulevard in South Boston. Who's here on behalf of the applicant? Uh, 
How you doing, Commissioner? Uh, this is Thomas Fulton of the DCR. I'm here with Tom Keo of AECOM. Um, here he is now. Sorry, he'll uh, he's going to be presenting this this afternoon. Okay, thank you. Apologize, it was uh, I unmuted, but I had to wait for the host, so I was talking to myself there for about 15 seconds. <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> so, um, yes, my name is uh, Tom Keo. I'm a wetland scientist with AECOM, and as always, I'm joined by uh, Tom Bolton. Um, the project you have before you this evening is the installation of a six inch water line within William J. Day Boulevard um, out to Castle Island. Uh, it'll be a six inch water service line. Um, it will begin at the Murphy Memorial Skating Rink and then it will travel within the roadway until uh, Sullivan's Restaurant out by Castle Island. Um, the project is located in the buffer zone, several resources there on the coast, as you, as you can see. Uh, the water line will be installed on the side of the street that is furthest away um, from the beach and the boardwalk, so the opposite side of the street. Um, as depicted on our plan set, erosion controls will consist of um, the placement of the silt sacks within the catch basin, there is a crown on the road that would prevent, um, you know, during a flash rain event or anything like that, the sediment from getting up over the road and down into the, the basins on the other side. But it's all protected by curbing as well uh, to prevent anything from getting onto the beach itself. Uh, no work would be performed in the rain. Everything would be done in the dry. Um, the trench would be excavated. We'd excavate only a length of trench that the pipe could be installed in in one day. Uh, so there, you know, there's not gonna be a large open trench all along the boulevard. Um, once that segment of pipe is put in, the trench would then be backfilled and compacted. Uh, they'd come back the next day and work on that. Um, now, typically when the project like this is in the buffer zone, it's exempt from regulation, but this one also happens to be within land subject to coastal storm flowage. Um, you know, we, we all understand that there are performance standards for land subject to coastal storm flowage in the works, uh, but currently we do not have any, and that is why we're here this evening before you with a request for determination. Uh, once the project is complete, the uh, trench has been patched, uh, there'll be no signs that, you know, the work ever took place. Great. Is that it? Uh, that would be it in a nutshell, yes. It's just... Uh, not a really complicated project. I threw in just a couple of photos to give you an idea. We're coming right out of the Murphy rink here. Um, and then looking at the rink, the photo, the line is gonna go to the right. And then it's going to hug this left-hand side of the street all the way down to Sullivan's. Right. And once again, just an example of the plan, you can see all the call outs for the catch basins um, that will be going in to make sure that the silt sacks get placed uh, within those. Right, and that would be it. I'd be happy to uh, take any questions. And uh, so would Tom Bolton as well. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, I don't have anything. Eleanor, um, what do you have on this? We didn't have anything to note on this either. Um, but yeah, everything was basically covered by the presentation. We were able to do a site visit and we, we got to walk from the start of where the work is going to be to um, to Sullivan. So it was a nice site walk, but yeah, it is it seems straightforward. How long did you stay at Sullivan's? <laughs> Unfortunately, it wasn't open. It was actually pretty rainy. So we, we appreciated um, both of the Toms meeting us there. It was, yeah, not the best day. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, and I assume with uh, standard erosion controls, if we take this vote? Uh, yes, that would be our recommendation. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Sullivan, anything on this? Uh, nothing on the new installation. I was just curious, you're tying into a four inch line feeding the rink. Is that, that tie, and then metering it afterwards. Um, is that four inch line already master metered, you know? Uh, it is not the, the four inch meter is, uh, I mean, the four inch line is metered in the building in, uh, in the rink itself. Yeah. So that's why we're putting another meter on this line that the meter right. be in the parking lot. Yeah. Cause that that's prohibited by the Boston water sewer. So when you get the plans over there, 
uh, we'll have to deal with that. Okay. Uh, that issue. So that, that was my only comment. And do you know if that four inch line is tuberculated or is it spent line? I'm just wondering if you're tying into a dirty old pipe. I believe it is a new line that was no, not brand new, but put in, in the uh, early two thousands. Oh, okay. No, that would be fine. Mm -hmm. All right. Now that, that was my only comment. Did no comments on the installation and what they proposed. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Long. No comments. Thank you. Commissioner Wilson. Um, just two questions. One was given sort of, this is basically a, a line for DCR tenants at the end of it by a castle Island. But I was just curious, like in terms of there's not much out there, whether there was a similar line that's going over to the Conley terminal or like how, how is infrastructure consolidated given it's a long run? To... So that's a, uh, that's a good question. And that kind of goes to why we're actually doing this so right now. We are fed through the Conley Conley terminal in the, uh, in the pier. Um, but there's so much, there's a, there's a lot of uh, water main within that facility, and there's a lot of stagnant water, which is creating bacteria, and we're getting bacteria hits within uh, Sullivan's and the uh, rest of the, the bathrooms and the facilities within Castle Island because of the stagnant water. And the only way to do that is uh, to clean that out is really to, to flush the system regularly and um, in the pier, in the, in the, they're not willing to do that for just us. The main... Uh, services, you know, for, for more than for basically fire control for them, so that they don't they have no reason to actually flush the line, except for us. So we're kind of removing ourselves from that from that uh, from that system. And that's what this line is being being put in for. Yeah, yeah, no, no, appreciate that context. The only other bit would be is like in terms of that this is again sort of you know sort of infrastructure right at the end of the line, literally. Um, whether there's any other sort of coordinated upgrades associated with it, given that, you know, I don't know whether it's like cooking gas or electric or other things that could be sort of consolidated with, you know, digging up a trench and covering it once as opposed to having to do it multiple times. I, I know the good question, but those things are not needed up there um, at this time anyway. That's all on my end. Yeah, thanks. And I've never had a sunny day at Sullivan's, but it's always been a good time. So thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, Commissioner Richmond. Yeah, I, I have a question which I think has already been answered, but it, it didn't did the proponents say that this trench was only going to be open for a day? Um, it will it will be opened every day and closed at the end of the day. So no open trench will, will be left. Okay. Uh, all right. I misunderstood that. It, That's okay. it, it made no sense to me that way. Okay. So but at every at, at the end of every workday, you're going to be closing the trench by doing what? Backfilling. Okay. So you have to uncover it all the next day. Excuse me. I didn't you were breaking out. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, this this interference on this on this uh, line. Um, so that every day you're going to have to essentially open it again. That's well. The end of the trench will be plated, and then we would the, the next day we would just start at that point and keep digging. Okay, and and in the event of bad weather, you're not going to be working at all. That's correct. Okay. Thank you very much for answering my questions. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Elena, anybody from the public? No hands and nothing in the inbox either. Great, thank you. Okay, so with that, I would entertain a motion to issue a negative determination of applicability with the standard erosion control measures. So moved. You have a second. Thank you. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Long? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. I thought I was afraid that you escaped the Sullivan's already. Um, Commissioner Richmond? Aye. And I vote aye. So it carries five nothing. Okay, thank you, Tom. All right. Thank you. Thank have you. a good evening, all. Have, thank you very much, guys. Uh, next item on the agenda is a request for a determination of applicability from Northern Tree Service on behalf of the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority uh, to renew wetland delineations 
along the MBTA's right-of-way in Boston for the new MBTA Vegetation Management Plan uh, for 2024-2028, located in Dorchester, East Boston, and the West End. I'm not sure what for 2024-2028 is, but um, I think we have Clayton on the line. Maybe he can explain that to us. Or Calvin. Yeah. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. I, okay. It's been a while. <laughs> good to see you. Thank you. Uh, uh, good evening. I, I'm uh, the consultant on the project on behalf of the MBTA. And uh, with us tonight is uh, Alicia Thomas from the MBTA and Janice Kearney. And then we have uh, Amanda Smith from BSC Group uh, for wetland questions. So this uh, RDA is in response to um, 333 CMR 11 regulation that requires a, a vegetation management plan be in place in order to um, use herbicides in sensitive areas. And we need to um, get their wetland delineations approved so that we'll establish the uh, sensitive sites um, so that we can be in compliance with uh, the regulation. Um, so the, the numbers there that you were questioning that it's uh, the 2024 to 2028 uh, VMP. It's a five year uh, vegetation management plan per the regulation. And this um, is a successive one of many, as, as you know, I've been here before, before you, this has been in, uh, in the works since the late eighties, where we've had to uh, have a plan in place in order to treat insensitive sites. Um, the VMP and YLP explain all the processes that we use and, and how we do that. And we just need to have the wetland delineations um, approved. Uh, now, if, for those of you who were here for uh, the last time we were here, um, that was the big contention was that our wetland delineations were old um, and there was a lot of question around them. So um, since then we have, uh, we have redone them. We had uh, BSC group come in and uh, do those delineations and those maps that you have are the latest and greatest, um, which I think should address uh, concerns of the commission that we've um, done our diligence to make sure our wetlands are adequately delineated and that our sensitive sites are defined uh, appropriately. Um, so that's, um, and I just wanted to add that you know, the whole reason we're doing this, of course, is for the safety of the passengers that ride the T. Um, vegetation management is critical to uh, the safety and um, of track infrastructure and safe operation of the transit system. And um, that's why that's why we're here. Um, and so I'm, I'm open for questions. Uh, if unless anybody else from the, the T wanted to chime in and say something. No, you summarized it sufficiently, and, and it is the overreaching safety of the railway and the passengers thereof that uh, any incidental vegetation that could be problematic, as we've seen with some of the um, recent storms that create branches in the road and the railway and so on. So that's the uh, intent of the vegetation management plan as a whole. Okay. Okay. So... Part of the exercise here, and I'm sorry, maybe I should have understood this, but I didn't understand it, is to um, is to approve the uh, delineations of some wetland resource areas. And I'm looking through the NOI. Um, so Amanda, maybe um, do we have something we can show up on the screen here to show um, the delineations that you've made? Is there anything in a presentation or is it just what we have here in our um uh, it's just uh, what you guys have um but okay. could you put it up on the screen or would you like me to no you share can't share screen? unfortunately um okay I'm, I'm gonna go to elena elena um did you review the uh delineations did you did they look how did they look to you yeah so we we reviewed the delineations um we didn't have any specific concerns, um, especially once, sorry, I'm also pulling up the materials. Um, yeah, we didn't have any particular concerns with this, um, but also just flagging as commission staff, it was our first time reviewing this particular type of filing. So we would decidedly <laughs> defer to the commission probably more so than usual. 
Okay. I mean, last time, and Calvin, you may remember this, last time the plans we received um, didn't have enough definition for right. us to be. Yeah. And so um, my recollection, and I didn't look back at the last filing, uh, these plans are um, much better in resolution and detail than the plans we received last time. So, or at least the first set. Um, and you actually gave us... Um, some updated plans. Correct. Okay. Right. Yep. Yep. Okay. Okay. A little, a little back. A little background on the plans. Uh, so DEP came out with guidance on that um, of what they expected for us to present for plans, and they, because of the the original regulation, didn't have much. It was using to topographical maps, one in twenty four thousand. So we know how <laughs> detailed those are. So the. Um, uh, they re they required a one and two hundred inch scale, um, but of course we provided maps with one and a hundred inch scale because they're much easier to see. Um, so we we did better than what DEP requested for this uh, as a as a filing. So I just wanted to throw that in there. So I, no, I think she did that. a good job on that. Okay. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Sullivan. What do you have? Uh, I have no questions. Shockingly, of the MBTA on something. Okay. Um, Commissioner Long. Yeah, um, sorry if I missed something. Um, Calvin, are you looking for a positive determination on this or what, what was the protocol from previous years? Uh, well, positive on the 2A on accepting the delineations, but uh, a negative on the, uh, the um, section three there uh, on the RDA that we don't require, we're not required to have an NOI. Okay, thank you. Um, that was my only question. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Wilson. Um, yeah, no, completely appreciate the um, whatever higher resolution, lower scale level of maps. Super helpful. Um, two questions. One was sort of the method of application of the spray, whether that was like sort of by foot off of a um, maintenance train as needed one and done that sort of that that's come up before and i was just curious to where you guys landed with this um latest go around um in our in our vmp we we specify that um that we can use um backpack sprayers um and we can use um low pressure boom sprayers on the back of a truck um as as a as a potential option um, but in reality, uh, the way we've been doing it for the last basically five years is we've been doing it, we've been doing it all on foot by with backpack sprayers. Um, the reason for that is um, unlike um, you know commercial rail, where you have a train every you know hour or five hours or something, the T is a very hectic schedule with trains running all the time. There's not enough time at night with maintenance going on in the T to actually do the treatment. We used to do it all at night. Um, and so now we're doing it during the day with safety and flagmen and on the active rail, and we'll just um, follow safety procedures. And when a train comes, we all get off to the side, the train goes by, then they uh, blow the whistle, we get back on and keep treating. So we've done it all by backpack spraying. And I'd, I'd like to, uh, I, I, you know, I've, I've been a proponent of this for the whole plan and uh, even from the way back to the first one, we, we're selectively treating weeds. We're not doing a broadcast on the ballast. Um, so typically you would come in and do a broadcast pre-emergent um, and then come back and, and do a post-emergent on emerged weeds. So we're basically doing a post-emergent on emerged weeds um, and uh, the control has been excellent. Um, and we've, we have um, a very low rate of herbicide per acre. I think probably, I would go out on a limb to say it's probably some of the lowest in the rail industry as far as, as what we're actually using because we're targeting the weeds to their problem. So the program has worked really well from that perspective. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. Thank you for the clarification. I think that's reflected in the plans, um, the sort of sensitivity, especially to the various water crossings that we see. Mm -hmm. um, the only other bit that I would ask about is um, in terms of more of a pro forma type of thing is like syncing up with, say, Cambridge Conservation Commission or whatnot, just making sure that 
um, given that some of these crossings are shared, that we have consistent standards on either side. And I mean, we all have the same goal. I'm sure you've coordinated with them, but just making yes. sure. That, yes. Yeah, we will have a filing with them as well in hearing. So, okay, cool. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner yeah. Rich. Uh, yeah, my my question is, um, um, well, it's nice. First of all, it's nice to know that repairs on the T are being are being done. That's the first thing. But the second thing, uh, the stuff that you're spraying, um, how toxic is it to animals like dogs and um, or or even kids? Um, so we're using materials that are. Um, approved um, by Mass Department of Agricultural Resources um, rights away division on their sensitive site list. So the state toxicologist has reviewed all these and the fact sheets are, are on their website for these. And so basically they're a very low uh, toxicity. Um, on the label, you can have a re-entry into the area as soon as they're dried, but we're not going to have re-entry because it's a fenced off rail corridor, so we won't have people coming in there. And it's being applied within a foot of the ground. There's no drift, there's no movement, and it stays put where it is. Um, and we'll basically be using the same materials that their previous applicant for Belmarsh, the glyphosate and... Um, we will probably have a pre-emergent mix with the glyphosate to prevent any other seeds from coming up in the area that we treated the plant. So it's a, uh, there, in fact, on the entire system, um, we will be using materials from the sensitive site list, not just in the sensitive areas. So, and is there any quality control on, you know, sort of checking that the stuff that's being uh, applied is what um, you you think it is? Yes, there is. Uh, again, MDAR, uh, the pesticide uh, inspectors come out and take samples from our tank and run them and check them and um, um, do that that backup. And they, they watch the crews to make sure they're doing it right. And so we are inspected um, and that process works pretty well. So yes, we um, I think the state has a very good uh, track record for all of the rights of way applications. Okay, that's great. You know, I, I would just make this observation and I'm sure that others would probably agree. And that is, um, you know, the, the areas of the T that have are fenced off, as you say, um, seem to be um, not fenced off for people who would like to, you know, spray paint and do other kinds of graffiti. So I <laughs> think that my my question about, you know, how dangerous it was had, had some bearing on my belief that even though it's fenced off, um, people are gonna be in there, whether we or you want them there or not. But thank you very much for answering my questions. You're welcome. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Elena, anybody from the public? I am not seeing any raised hands and nothing in our inbox either. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so with that, I would entertain a motion. I think this is the way to handle it uh, for a, um, to issue a positive determination of applicability for the wetlands uh, delineations. So moved. We have a second. Second. Thank you. Oops. Commissioner Sullivan. Aye. Commissioner Long. Aye. Commissioner Wilson. Aye. Commissioner Richmond. Aye. And I vote aye. That carries five to nothing. And uh, now I'd entertain a motion to issue a negative determination of applicability for the vegetation management work proposed by the applicant. So moved. Second. Thank you. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Long? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Commissioner Richmond? Aye. And I vote aye, so that carries five nothing. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, there's been a number of continuances. Um, continued um, our notice of intent for DEP file number 00617054 and Boston file number 2020 007. 
DEP file number 0061772 and Boston file number 2021-010. DEP file number 0061961 and Boston file number 2023-051. DEP file number 0061987 and Boston file number 2024-012. And DEP file number 0061988 and Boston file number 2024-013. Uh, we're now into our regular meeting, and I uh, noticed that I neglected to call for the uh, fourth um, request for a certificate of compliance when we um, move these to the uh, top of the hearing. So uh, next item on the agenda is a request for a certificate of compliance for DEP file number 0060955 for the construction of buildings five and six, landscaping and utilities associated with buildings five and six. An open space work located at 40 East Pier Drive in East Boston. Eleanor, what do you have on this? Yeah, so for this one, we would recommend that the commission continue uh, and hold off on a boat. We're still trying to sort out a few uh, ambiguities that we have about the stormwater system and about some uh, landscaping that has potentially been ongoing. So until we resolve those items, uh, we would hold off on a recommendation to issue a COC. Okay, we'll table that one. Um, next item is administrative updates. Anything? We have nothing tonight. Okay. Um, the orders and conditions here from DCR, have those been resolved? Not yet, but we are getting close. <laughs> and hopefully Fantastic. we'll have an official update for that soon. Okay. Um, I was able to review the minutes from October 4th, 2023. Um, I was not able to review the uh, encyclopedic April 3rd, 2024 uh, meeting minutes. So um, I would entertain a motion to um, approve the meeting minutes from October 4th, 2023. So moved. You have a second? I have a boat to catch. Can someone second? Second, second. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Long? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Commissioner Richmond? Aye, and many thanks, the Chair, for reviewing the minutes. Oh, my pleasure. Um, and I vote um, aye. Uh, so that passes 5 nothing. So uh, all we have left is a motion to adjourn by acclamation. Um, good night, everyone. Elena, DD, thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you in a few weeks. Thank you. And just flagging that I will send out signature pages later this week, not tonight. So if you don't see them tonight, you're not missing anything. Okay. okay. Have a great night. Good night. Good night.